Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to get rolling and hopefully get done on time. So this is really uh, meant to give you a good overview of the geriatric patient in the emergency room. One of the luxuries of your program that's not really true in other locations is that you have a lot of psychiatry accessible to you in your in the ER, and you know there's a range of um, how the attendings handle this, but there's a lot of backup support. Um, in many parts of the country, there is no psychiatry available in the emergency room. There may not be any psychiatry available in the community. Um, I've spoken with the emergency uh, medicine residents at MSU, and they're on their own. They fly solo. So, you know, hopefully these are some pearls and some real-life cases that we're going to go through that you'll take with you and um, have a little bit in the back of your mind so that um, if you get into these situations, um, you won't run into too many difficulties. So, um, so I thought we would do a couple pre-test questions just to see where you guys are at. Um, so you, you all graduated medical school as far as I know, so I don't need to read the question to you. But um, Okay, so the basics here are the patient saying he's not depressed, he's just lonely. So here's the uh, question. Which of the following factors um, should raise your concern with this patient? Here's, here's how you're basically answering. Um, two of you are concerned about his diet and um, that would make sense from a nutritional standpoint because that could certainly affect his mood. Um, the majority of you are more concerned about the poor relationship with his um, kids. Um, you know, a couple of you are worried about his death wish and uh, no one's worried about that he's had no medical care um, and a couple of you are worried about the loss of his wife. So in general, the death wish isn't really a big concern. A death wish is more of a normal occurrence that people have. These people are not suicidal. They feel that they would be better off dead, but they're not going to do anything to take their lives. What's a bigger concern here, and we'll talk about later on, is the loss of his wife is the major red flag in this case. Um, because he's had a major life loss. Um, the other big concern is actually no medical care because what you may be missing here is actually a, a brewing delirium or some other infection that we, or some other medical process that hasn't been addressed for years with this guy. So here's the next case. This is actually a real case from the ER Cherry Hill. So what's the most likely diagnosis in this case? All right. So no one said schizophrenia, which is good. Um, and we'll talk about why that's good later on. Um, the majority of you thought that she was having a brief reactive psychosis. Um, as you can see, a couple of you thought maybe she had uh, cannabis or formaldehyde intoxication, which we would call, what's the street name? Wet. Wet. Great. Um, one person thought maybe there was a stroke, and several of you thought it was alcohol intoxication. Actually, this would be alcohol intoxication. For the brief reactive psychosis, you would want her to have a zero blood alcohol level. But as long as you have the substance involved, you have to go to the substance. The reason um, we're, we're coming up with it not being C is we don't have evidence that she was smoking anything. So we steer away from that. Okay. 
and last, also a Cherry Hill ER case. <coughs> All the fun in Cherry Hill. The, the person was throwing the furniture off the balcony of the high rises at 70 and 295. Okay. So, what do you do? See, the safe thing about this is I'm not picking on you to ask you who would prescribe what. You can just take your best guess and then we can talk about it. All right. So, um, so the majority of you thought about using um, haloperidol 2 milligrams IM. A uh, couple of you wanted to use uh, lorazepam. A couple of you wanted to use the risperidol. And a couple of you were using the Haldol IV. So, so there is a correct answer here. Um, the, you wouldn't want to use IV Haldol um, because what's the risk of IV Haldol? No one? Steve? Well, they can all lower seizure threshold except for the Ativan. So um, that's prolonged QT, but IV Haldol does something very specific with prolonged QT. I heard, thought I heard someone just say that. Torsades, that's the major risk, and that's why it is not FDA approved for use. Um, and especially you wouldn't want to use IV Haldol in an older adult unless all you had was IV access and you couldn't get close enough. Every year in the system we have um, about three to five cases of torsades from house staff using IV Haldol um, throughout the system. Um, you wouldn't want to use the IM Risperidol because the Risperidone 37.5 injectable is a long-acting drug and it actually would take three injections over four weeks to get to a therapeutic level. So not a great choice um, and something you want to shy away from. Um, you, you could use the Ativan, but you wouldn't want to use the lorazepam by itself because most of the evidence shows that when you're doing that, what begins to happen is you're actually disinhibiting the patient and you may make the patient more agitated rather than less agitated which really brings us to the correct answer, which is um, haloperidol, two milligrams IM. You can actually rapidly tranquilize this patient, meaning you could give Haldol every hour till sedation if you needed to. We don't often rapidly trank. I can't think of the last time we've done that in the emergency department here, but it is, it is certainly evidence-based and a uh, way to go. The, the delirium literature, which is how we would describe this patient, would support the use of Haldol consistently. Um, does not support the use of any of the second generation drugs, um, with the exception of Risperdal, and that is only available orally. Um, but even the literature as recently as last year says that Haldol is the drug of choice in delirium, in spite of what happy pharmaceutical rep may tell you. So one of the reasons we're doing this with all of you is there's still tremendous stigma with treating older adults. Um, Samuel Shem in, in the late 60s wrote the book um, House of God. Have any of you read that? Has anyone not read that? Mandatory reading. Um, but what's really sad is we haven't improved geriatric care much beyond what he describes. Um, and there's a huge stigma still associated with these patients, some of which isn't helped by your attendings, some of it which is not helped by the fact that these patients get over-medicated. They're very complicated cases, but hopefully through the series we'll, um, we'll help you guys treat these patients a little bit better. When we talk about mental illness, though, in the elderly, mental illness has definite presentations, but it also has definite ages that it occurs. Um, in, in, one of the, in, in one of the many things that we do at the Institute, we're involved with a statewide crisis diversion program for nursing homes, and we see 
these really absurd diagnoses given to 80 and even 75 year olds. And there's no way these people have these diagnoses. Um, but people are writing these diagnoses primarily to fit the medication they're given, not because these people ever have symptoms. So the system is completely out of control um, with some of the older adults. And you need to be sensitive to that because as osteopathic emergency room physicians, when a patient comes in, you need to be able to ask the right questions because it's not that the primary care doctor they may be seeing in the community may not be great, but you can do a better job and you will want to do a better job. And that's why we're going through this. Um, the DSM-5, which is recently out, um, as did the prior versions of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, I want to make sure that you understand this piece because you can't come up with a psychiatric diagnosis until you've ruled out the underlying medical cause. And if there are substances on board, that overrides it. So in the case of the lady who was at the party with no prior history and became psychotic because her blood alcohol level was elevated, that's why it was alcohol intoxication until proven otherwise for her diagnosis. That's why your um, psychiatric partners in the crisis centers will ask you perhaps to do more of a workup than you're used to on older patients because we need to make sure that there isn't an underlying medical problem. The majority of what comes into the emergency room that's older adult and looks psychiatric is most likely delirium. And we know when, did Dr. Chopra do the le delirium lecture yet? So you had the delirium lecture where we know in the US, delirium is often missed in the emergency room. And we need to do a better job with that. And I think you all are starting to do a better job with that. But the psychiatric diagnosis um, goes hand in hand with that thinking. We also know that diseases break out by age. So in the patient who became psychotic, the reason schizophrenia wasn't an option for that person is schizophrenia is a really a disorder of younger people. There is a late life variant of schizophrenia that has an onset of 65 to 75, but these people are not functioning like all of you up to 65. These are people who are odd and eccentric throughout their life, and then something emerges much later on. Um, you wouldn't see an 80-year-old suddenly become manic or bi with bipolar disorder because bipolar disorder is a disorder of young adults. It's a disorder of people in their 20s and 30s with occasionally people in their 40s becoming diagnosed. But if someone doesn't have any history of bipolar disorder when they're younger, chances are they're not manic. And that's not bipolar disorder that's hitting your door. Um, Major depression and anxiety disorders can emerge at any point during the lifespan. Um, and there are a lot of factors why that will happen. And depression has a whole range from major depression to what's referred to as subsyndromal or minor depression, um, which is just a low grade depression. Um, you know, dementias really are um, very prevalent in older adults and if you have someone who's 80 with an acute mental status change you want to think delirium and you want to think that there's an underlying dementia because almost half of that population has some sort of cognitive problem at that point so the good news is you've lived into your 80s the bad news is you're running the greatest risk of any disease regardless of age does that make sense any questions? Okay. So, what's the most common psychiatric disorder in the older adult? So, the majority of you nailed this. It's, it is, in fact, depression. Um, I'm really happy with the one person who said substance use, and I'm thrilled because you're thinking. And we're going to go through substance use, and it's something, how many of you, and I'll ask this, we'll get into this, how many of you actually ask about substance use in older adults when you see them? Good. Um, delirium is luckily not the most common thing, but I'm glad that delirium is up there in the way that you're thinking, um, because it says to me that you're retaining what we're teaching you, um, and we're glad delirium's not most common. Um, 
but it is in fact um, depression. Depending upon the statistics, dementia runs second. Um, and we hope that dementia stays second because the minute dementia becomes the number one disorder, we have a problem. So it's estimated that about 5% of the people in the community and, um, have a major depression, and you're running close to 20%, 16% of people with a minor or subsyndromal depression. It's very significant um, out there, and there are reasons for this. One of the things that happens as we all get older is there are losses. There are losses of partners. There are losses of kids, unfortunately. There are losses of pets. But a lot of the people that are coming in to see you have lost independence. They may have functional limitations. They may have losses because they're on dialysis. They may be taking lots of medications. Um, and that all factors in. Um, Depression in and of itself can increase the likelihood of the patient dying by almost four times. So you really want to give these people a good medical workup. And remember that not everyone with depression needs to be hospitalized. So that shouldn't be your first knee jerk. The reality, though, is these tend to be your frequent flyers. These are the people who are going to come in for your services more often. You know, and they're also going to their primary care visits more often for those of them who have primary care doctors. Um, but we know that they're high utilizers of emergency room services. Um, and when they are hospitalized, these are the people who tend to have the longer lengths of stays. So these are really the nightmares for the hospital systems. Um, but they, they often have multifactorial. Um, the risks for depression are really enormous. and. There are medical factor risks. We're learning more and more in the last um, 10 to 15 years how cardiac disease really impacts depression and how they go hand in hand. We know that patients who have had a stroke with no functional limitation are running about a 70% risk of developing some sort of depression even two years post-stroke. Um, we're starting to get some data that uh, diseases of the pulmonary system will also cause depression. We know they certainly contribute to anxieties. Um, air hunger is certainly one of the main driving um, anxieties in older adult. Um, and you have to go over these patients with a fine tooth comb because their medications may actually be playing a role in the depression as well, um, beta blockers being the worst offenders in the group currently. Um, so, one of the big factors, and it's kind of a catch-22, is this. The increased medication usage may actually be what's driving the PCP visits and the emergency room visits. And if you think about it, osteopathically, this is not the way we want to treat these patients. Um, on your geriatric team at NJISA, the geriatric psychiatry team, what we do is stop more medications than we ever start and the patients get better. So it's much easier to take people off medications and get rid of the junk and they do better. But you can easily understand in a primary care setting or in an ER setting when a patient keeps presenting, it's much easier to give them the script and send them on their way than it is to sit with the patient and sit with the family and explain why they don't need the medicine. It's estimated that writing a script, you know, not considering e-prescribing, takes about two to three minutes, but sitting with a patient and explaining to them why they don't need medication could be taking 20 minutes or more. So it's much easier to just write a medicine and let them go, but it actually drives the problem. So which age group is the highest age group for completing suicide? So you can see the vast majority of you thought 60 to 70. Um, what's um, interesting is that the, the, 12, the, the, the A group, the 12 to 20 year olds, they're the group that most likely will threaten suicide or make attempts. But they don't want to die. There are more calls for help. This is um, you know, very common. The, it's actually 
the 80 to 90 year old age group, the 85 year olds are, and above, are the greatest risk for completing suicide. Um, these are the people who really feel that they've lived their life, that they've, they're done and they want out, and they'll do it via mo the most lethal means. These people don't make attempts. So if you get someone who's coming in, and that's what we're going to cover in a second, um, if you get someone who's coming in and they're sending up the red flags, these are your highest risk groups because you may not have another opportunity to intervene with these patients. So um, here's another case. This is a 78-year-old who was a concentration camp survivor and a nuclear physicist. Um, his wife died six months before I saw him, and he was helpless, hopeless, withdrawn, and not eating, and he said life was not worth living. So this is the part that I was trying to stress to you a second ago. 60% of the patients who complete suicide in this age group will see a physician one month before it happens. And in forensic studies looking at the physician notes, there are very few indicators that the patient was going to take their life in that visit. The risk factors are there, but the patient's not saying goodbye. The patient is just coming in for a normal visit. Um, it's estimated that older adult suicide is the 11th cause of death in this country. So that's something that we really all could take a role in trying to decrease. So these are the risk factors. You want to look for someone who's an older white male. So any idea why that's a risk factor? Sounds good. Why might that be the risk factor? Certainly a good idea. They live longer. Anyone else? Okay. So in reality, older white women tend to live the longest. White men tend not to live as long as the women. Um, these are the people who tend to have been in positions of power and authority. This is still the age group that didn't have um, there were, there were, you know, because of discrimination, because of glass ceilings, they were the ones who were able to achieve the highest levels of um, power and authority. These people also tend to have been married to their jobs so that they don't have a lot of family or friends who they're close to any longer. And as they've been in through their late life, because everyone around them had pulled away years ago, they tend to be very isolated as an age group. Um, so that's why it's older white men. This is expected to change within the next five to ten years as people who were the benefit of changes in the late 60s and early 70s um, also have been in leadership positions um, and they have, are aging out. So these people tend to be single. There's no real support system. Um, we're already covered no close friends or family. Um, multiple medical problems. So if someone comes in and they have the first three, raises a little bit of a flag, but it's the multiple medical problems that tends to start tipping the scale. And you've seen patients come in who are in their 80s who don't have a lot of medical problems, but that's not the, the usual. The majority of the patients tend to have more medical problems than not. Um, and these people are drinking. So you really want to get an alcohol history on them. Um, and we know that alcohol drives older adult suicide. So when you look at the suicide breakout, this is um, the, the statistics from the federal government. Um, in the general population, per 100,000, it's about 11.5 people per 100,000 um, complete suicide. But in the 80 to 84 age group, that number is 45 per 100,000. It's, it's almost four times, it's like three times the, the general population rate. Um, and it's double the population rate in people in their 30s. So how do you assess this, especially if you don't have a handy dandy crisis center attached to your emergency room? You need to ask some, some very key questions. Have there been any other prior attempts? And again, you have to be able to fish out people who are having death wishes, I wish I were dead, from life's no longer worth living. Because they're two very different things. You know, 
if um, if God were to take me when I'm sleeping, it wouldn't be so bad. Versus, you know, no one's going to miss me if I'm gone. They're very different ends of the spectrum. Um, is there a history of any depression or any psychiatric illness? That's important to to really assess and really getting a good substance history. Is this someone who's used to having a cocktail a night and now they're having three or four cocktails a night? Are they downing a six pack of beer a day or a case of beer a day? Um, are they still smoking weed? Um, not an unusual thing to find out. Um, has there been a history of impulse control issues? Is this someone who flies off the handle very easily, punches holes in walls, breaks things? Um, you know, the Eagles missed their field goal attempt and um, the TV wound up on the floor. You know, you want to know that about the patient. Um, what's their social support like? Are there kids that they even talk to? Are they, do they not have any kids? Um, did, their, did their partner die or did they separate or divorce? Um, and, you know, what other stressors have been going on recently? Have they lost friends, a pet? Um, you know, we, we saw a very big uptick in this over the last four years when the economy tanked. People like this who had millions of dollars lost huge amounts of their wealth. And that drove some suicides as well because they didn't have the money they thought they had to live the life they wanted to. So who, on the next question, who abuses alcohol more? Notice it doesn't say um, emergency room residents. <laughs> wow. So why'd you guys say that? Personal experience? No, seriously, why did you? <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be Santa Claus? <laughs> <laughs> I've been calling Santa Claus for most of my type of rotation at work. Yeah. Usually, usually male. Okay. So, um, by the way, 100% correct. And then, who's abusing prescription drugs more? Am I missing something? <laughs> okay. For whoever answered D, please see me later because we need to talk about the phantom question that you're seeing. Um, so this also is correct. And, and why is this? Because there's a lot of data why this is. Rates of anxiety and depression, good. Less use of alcohol. Thanks, man. Really good. Um, so women tend to be more nurturers. So they tend to share prescriptions. And both of these actually go back to what's socially acceptable. Um, until probably the last 15, 20 years, it wasn't as socially acceptable for women to drink. So women tended to abuse pills more because society says that's more polite, if you will. You know, the image for guys is, you know, you go to a bar, you bang back a few with your friends, and that's okay, but not necessarily the case for women. These are both very big hot-button issues, though, nationally, because um, this year, this past year, in 13, marked the first year in the U.S. where prescription drug abuse surpassed um, uh, illegal street drug abuse in the U.S. So it's actually a very big issue that you're all going to be wrestling with through your entire careers. Um, so how that's playing out is very unpredictable across the country. The AOA's response to that has been to develop a certificate of added qualifications in um, pain management. And that's really in a response in response to the states of Washington and uh, Florida now restricting who can prescribe controlled substances. 
And if you don't have, if you haven't done a pain medicine, uh, additional pain medicine training, and you don't ha have a certificate of added qualifications, you're actually restricted on your ability to prescribe those controlled substances. New Jersey um, has actually been working very closely with Dr. German at the NMI um, to come up with a, uh, a more cohesive response than mandating training and, um, and extra testing of the physicians. But this is a very, very big issue. And think about this. Um, you know, you were home for, you know, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever, and you said you had a headache at the table, at the dinner table, what happens next? Everybody has something. It's CVS suddenly appears at your dinner table. So um, not, not an unusual issue. You know, we know that um, alcohol use, there's a survey that was done um, just two years ago in looking at men and women in the past 30 days who are greater than 60 years old. And this is how it came out. You know, the, the number of women has actually crept up with alcohol usage. It's not this huge disparity that it looks like when you do who uses alcohol more. But um, the cannabis numbers are pretty interesting too. How many of you ask? Cannabis use. So um, quick story, I was seeing a patient, an 80 year old lady in a subacute unit um, she had COPD, she's on an oxygen tank, and I always ask the question. So, um, you know, she was talking about her alcohol use, and she drinks like three or four glasses of wine a night, which probably means she's drinking more. Um, and then I asked her, do you use marijuana? And she says, what do you know? <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean, what do I know? And she said, well, what did they tell you? And I said, no one told me anything, it's a normal question. But I already knew I was in for something because it's not a normal response. So, so she went on to tell me that she's been using for the past three or four years because it helped with her pain. Okay, that made sense, it's in the news, you know, we all know that that could be the case even though New Jersey didn't have med medical marijuana at the time, and even if it did, the likelihood of her getting to a dispensary was probably slim to none. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. How did you even, how did you even get into that? And she said, well, when I was in the Navy, I used to smoke a little bit. And I'm thinking, you're 80 years old, when the heck were you in the Navy? So I said, well, when were you in the Navy? And she said, well, maybe like five or 10 years ago. And I said, you were in the Navy when you were 70? And she said, uh, oh, I guess I've been doing it a lot longer because I was in the Navy when I was 20. So then this cute little lady with the oxygen says to me, would you like to buy any? <laughs> and I said, mm, no, I'm not. She says, well, I have a pound and a half at home, and I don't know what to do with it. And I said, how do you have a pound and a half at home? And she said, well, I grow my own. <laughs> so, so here you have this lady who's relatively frail in a wheelchair, with an oxygen tank on the back of the wheelchair and oxygen on, and, and she's like a major grower in South Jersey. <laughs> she then thanked me because she decided what she was gonna do with her marijuana, and her solution was she was baking brownies as a thank you for the nursing staff. <laughs> so my message to you is be very careful if the nurses offer you food. The issue, though, becomes a little more complicated when we look at other narcotics in older adults. Because, again, you have to remember that the baby boomers are now in their 60s. And this is the first large cohort of habitual recreational drug users. And they haven't stopped. Think share. These people have not stopped, and they don't see themselves as 60 or older. They see themselves as much younger. And so they're continuing their use. Um, and the study went on to look at other drugs that these people are using, and the numbers are pretty compelling. And so it really is starting to make more sense when you're seeing people coming in to pick up drug screens, especially when you're not sure what's going on because the data would suggest that this isn't a zebra. 
that there really may be something going on here that you may be missing. You know, we know when people are using, abusing alcohol, some of the key signs are that they're not meeting certain obligations. The problem with older adults, if you think about it, it's very hard to diagnose an older adult with abuse because they may not have social or occupational problems because they're no longer working. And if every day is the same, they may not be missing so many social obligations. There may not be drinking in a hazardous situation because if they're not going out regularly, um, and do all of you know, because this was always a shocker to me, that out liquor stores deliver? Liquor stores in South Jersey used to deliver way before. Why are you making that face? What? <laughs> Which one is that? You're surprised? OK. You haven't tried it out. Um, Liquor stores delivered way before pharmacies delivered in South Jersey, which was always very bizarre that that would be the case. Um, alcohol dependence is different than abuse. Here these people have tolerance, they're going into withdrawal, um, and they've tried to quit. The problem with the older patient is they may not go into withdrawal, and they may not ever try to quit because they kind of enjoy what they're doing. Um, which makes diagnosis a little bit more challenging in this population. And some of the reason it's challenging is if you think, how many of you went to SOM? Are you embarrassed to say you went to SOM? What was that about? There was someone was doing this. Um, if you remember back to Geriatrics 101 in your second year, you know, your physiology changes as we all age. And the physiological changes impact the ability to absorb and metabolize alcohol, which impacts the ability to diagnose the difference between tolerance and abuse in an older patient. This is a real ad, by the way. <laughs> um, this is a champagne ad that I uh, had found and thought it was a, a little bit uh, bizarre. Um, but it really underscored this whole stereotyping that we do that older adults aren't boozing it up, but in fact they are. Um, and older adults will have an atypical presentation. You may not get that they're drinking first, but if you start hearing that they're not sleeping well, start asking alcohol questions because that may be your gateway into that um, decision tree. Um, if there's new onset confusion, has the alcohol use increased? Maybe the mental status change is substance related. Maybe it's not a delirium or an de underlying dementia. Um, is the family or partner now reporting to you that the patient is more irritable than they've been? Could be a red flag that alcohol use has suddenly gone up some more. Um, you know, are they falling? may in fact be that they're intoxicated and that's why they're tripping and falling more because they're, they're dizzy. And um, we need to break this. You need to break the stereotyping because we see this very commonly. And it's, am it's amazing to me how many patients come into the office and when you ask the questions, you get some very honest answers, but they're not the answers you were expecting. So um, the easy screening tool, which doesn't work well in older adults, is the CAGE. And I, even though it doesn't work well in older adults, it's good to have in your bag of tricks in the emergency department anyway. Do they, does the patient need to cut down? Are they annoyed when patients talk about alcohol with them? Do they feel guilty about their drinking? Do they need an eye opener in the morning? If any of you are answering yes to this, don't talk to your colleagues. There are plenty of services at the school to deal with that. But, um, the problem is that older adults often don't feel guilty and because of tolerance issues don't often need an eye opener. So the cage won't work well for an older patient. You'll always come up negative, in fact. Which is why um, Michigan, uh, University of Michigan um, developed the, the Michigan um, screen, the Michigan Alcohol Screening Test, or the MAST, and they came up with a geriatric version, or the MAST-G. Um, a little bit complicated to do in an emergency room, but if you have a really big suspicion, and this is free, you can pull it offline, I would recommend using the short form, which is only 13 questions, but you may nail something that you'd otherwise be missing. 
think this may actually be the last question. When a geriatric patient presents a psychotic, what's most likely going on? Great. So, um, most, and I see everyone was paying attention with C, so that was good. In fact, E is the right answer. Um, most likely due to a general medical condition, and that's great because if you think about it, schizophrenia, they would need a history of schizophrenia. Brief reactive psychosis mm, could happen, it's a possibility, but not so much. Substance abuse definitely can produce psychosis, but you know, here you're looking at age, here you're looking for no medical problems, here you're looking for evidence of the um, substance, so the most likely answer is due to a medical condition, um, which is pretty common in older adults. So not an unusual event. I mean, you're talking about almost 25% of older adults who are coming into emergency rooms having some sort of medically based psychosis, and there are multiple risk factors here. I would tell you that in our experience, the number one risk factor is the bottom one, multiple medication usage. Um, and that's where you can all shine as osteopathic emergency room physicians because really doing a careful medication reconciliation, looking at anticholinergic load, looking at duplication of therapy. Um, there's another, uh, another lecture that um, on prescribing cascades, which I could talk to Dr. Scally about, but basically this lady wound up with serotonin syndrome because well-meaning primary care doctor had her on um, triple the amount of an SSRI and an NSRI together, and that was what precipitated some of her psychosis. So, you know, the workup is really important here, and as well as the history taking to figure out what exactly has been going on. Um, and you want to know, when did the psychosis occur? Is an, an early onset psychosis, meaning has this been happening for a long time, in which case maybe there's been a psychiatric illness that no one ever diagnosed, maybe there's a substance use history that's been going on for a long period of time, or is it late life onset with or without a dementia, in which case could it be a delirium or is it due to something else medically that's going on acutely? It's, so if you can exclude um, underlying psychiatric illness, you need to go for medical in, in an older adult first. Um, there are a rare, few rare cases, and um, we've certainly seen them in the system, where you go through all of this and there's no prior psychiatric history, there's no substance use, there's nothing medical going on, and it is in fact, um, it is in fact uh, an illness that was missed, a psychiatric illness that was missed. So, I was wrong. What's your favorite agent to calm someone down? <laughs> really? Abilify, seriously? Um, so the literature really supports Haldol, um, inexpensive, predictable, lots and lots of evidence. Um, Abilify does not really have the evidence and it's expensive. So why are you doing that when an older product works just as well, if not better? Um, so in terms of treating someone though with agitation, what you want to do is environmental management first. And emergency departments are not necessarily the best places to keep patients calm. But it, some emergency rooms have been going toward quiet rooms, not like a psychiatric side of the room, but just a room with dimmer lighting where they can de-escalate a patient and really educating families and caregivers. What did I do? Oh. Educating families and caregivers that medications may be causing this or other problems may be causing this. Um, is important because the families who are coming in are also of the mindset, what are you going to give my loved one? We're, we're a pill nation. You know, it's like trick or treat. If you go to someone's door and they don't give you candy, you feel like you're gypped. And if you go to a physician in any setting and you don't get a prescription, you're missing out. It's not the American way. So um, this may actually be the last question. So by the way, 
This is the real ad for Thorazine from uh, the late 60s, early 70s, and um, really kind of frightening in, in a bizarre geriatric stigma way. So I, this question I threw in because occasionally we get someone who um, uses Thorazine in the emergency room. And um, I had asked this question to an attending once, and the comment was, what do you mean you can convert Thorazine to Haldol? So that's why I put it in. OK, so um, oh, no one thought 1 to 1. That's good. Um, most of you thought it was 10 to 1, obviously. A couple people 50, a couple people 100, and a couple people 200. The correct answer is D. Every 100 milligrams of Thorazine is about 1 milligram of Haldol. It's 1 to 2. So for those of you who've ever used intramuscular Thorazine, and you've given 50 milligrams, and then you call me and you say, how come nothing's happened to the patient? Why are they still agitated? I'll say, do you remember this? Um, but if you give even 100 milligrams of Thorazine, it's a drop in the bucket compared to Haldol, which is why haloperidol is a much more effective drug. Thorazine is considered a low potency first generation antipsychotic. Haloperidol, high potency first generation antipsychotic. So um, really no reason to use Thorazine, although occasionally it, it creeps back up. So I, I started talking about rapid tranquilization in the pretest. Um, you can give 0 0.5 to 1 milligram of Haldol in an older adult every hour until they're sedated, if you needed to. Um, as a psychiatrist, I might, in an older adult, use 2 or 5 milligrams to start off um, based on what the agitation is, based on the body habitus, and based on their past psychiatric history. Um, the, the other thing that's interesting and always a fun conversation with nursing staff when it's slow in your board is the rates of onset. So when you give oral antipsychotics in general, or oral Haldol specifically, the rate of onset is about one and a half hours a long time when someone's like beating up the staff or threatening the staff or thrashing. But the difference between IM versus IV Haldol is the same. They're both 45 minutes. So again, if you look at it from a risk-benefit standpoint, why would you give IV? It's not going to work any faster than the IM. But the nursing staff will tell you, oh, it I've seen it work faster. Well, okay. Seeing it work faster and what the psychopharmacology says, you know, we'll go with the evidence. Um, we already covered this. So, um, in terms of the atypical, or now as they're being referred to, the second generation antipsychotics, the most well um, studied of these drugs is risperidol. Um, and risperidol is actually starting to creep into the literature as effective treatment for agitation and delirium in addition to haloperidol. Um, but, oh, I should go back for this. but the data doesn't support any of the other second generation drugs currently. There's, there's no data that's saying that these drugs are, the other second generations are effective for acute agitation. Um, the benzodiazepines actually can exacerbate the problems. Um, you may get total disinhibition. Think about it as giving them medication to get them drunk because you're working on the GABA system. Um, they're absolutely indicated in a patient who's in withdrawal, especially from alcohol, but you wouldn't want to use this in acute delirium or acute agitation. Um, in terms of involuntary hospitalization, you really need to know your state regulations. New Jersey's regulations are not the same as Pennsylvania's or New York's. This is one of the areas where there is no federal regulation, so the states come up with their own individual issues. It becomes a very big problem in the counties that border those states because, which in New Jersey is almost every county except like five, um, because families come over from the other state and think that the other state law would apply. 
In Pennsylvania, families can actually petition. You may see families come into the emergency room. It happens often in Cherry Hill. We want to put, you know, mom or dad in the hospital. You can't do that in New Jersey. You can't petition. Um, and realize that the screening centers, the crisis centers, are just screening centers. They're not emergency psychiatric treatment centers. Their decision is, should the patient go into the hospital or not? And if they're going to go in, do they go in voluntarily or involuntarily? They're, most of them do not have a psychiatrist in the facility. Uh, more and more of them only have a psychiatrist available via TV monitor, which is not ideal. Um, and um, the problem is the families come in and they think just as they can see all of you for their neck cut or sore throat that they can go to the screening center because they ran out of their antidepressant or mom can get acute or dad can get acute psychiatric treatment for depression or anxiety and that's not what they do. Um, the other friction that comes up I see with all of you and the crisis centers is the state mandate is least restrictive setting. So they're being driven to put people back in the community. New Jersey has actually been debedding psychiatric um, hospital beds, which is why you get these huge backups in all of your emergency rooms. Um, we've actually been talking to the state about it, um, but they just don't see that as an area that they want to do that. The state of New Jersey has closed two um, state psychiatric hospitals in the last 10 years and is looking to take beds away from Ancora um, next. Um, and they're not replacing any of those beds. So it, it makes the population that needs to go in uh, more difficult, which is one of the reasons some of the substance use patients are not hospitalized any longer because they're taking up beds for people who may otherwise need them. Um, Commitment in New Jersey is actually a really serious issue. If any of us wind up needing commitment, we lose our medical license in the state. Um, if you own a gun, you lose your gun license and you don't get it back. Um, so medical license, you can petition to get back, but the gun license, they won't give you back. Everything you learned in undergraduate applies. Careful osteopathic assessment of the patient is the best way to treat the older adult coming into the emergency room. And you can't look at them and say, oh, you know, they're, they're 80, they're not using, they're not drinking. You know, you need to look at the whole picture. But also remember that the disorders of younger adults, while they'll carry over, you're not going to see a new schizophrenia or a new bipolar disorder develop in an 80-year-old if they've had no prior history. And if someone comes in with a diagnosis, say a bipolar disorder, you can ask them questions like, have you ever not been sleeping for days on end? Do you ever feel like you're full of energy? And what do you do when you have all that energy? When you're getting no, 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 no on that, you may be finding someone who's on a mood stabilizer where they put the diagnosis of bipolar disorder to fit the mood stabilizer rather than the mood stabilizer to fit the diagnosis. It's completely backwards. Um, older, adult pre older adults will present to you very atypically, and you have to remember that because they're more challenging and they're definitely more time intensive. But I think also they're more appreciative when you do take time with them. Their families are more appreciative and they can be very rewarding. Um, so, you know, in terms of looking at agitation, you want to make sure the environment is calm as possible. Um, you may want a room with dim lights, maybe further away from all the noise and hustle and bustle. Um, Haldol is your drug of choice and your friend. Um, you can go up to about 60 milligrams in 24 hours if you needed to. If you need to go anywhere above 30 in an older adult, something is dramatically wrong and um, many of you know my cell phone or how to get me, so you just get a hold of me. Um, but all of you can really make a difference, not only in the suicide rates, but in the assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of these patients who are really quite amazing to work with. And you know, one of the things I love about them is they're all stories. They're great storybooks. Um, some of these people are um, bring histories to you that you won't get anywhere else. And they're worth sitting and listening to, which is not always easy when you're running around. Um, but certainly uh, the rewards of treating them outweigh the, the disadvantages. Thank you.